Pozdrav, dragi narode. Dobro došli u još jednu epizodu Slobodni. Danasna tema je ekonomija, bakarstvo, Central Bank Digital Currency. Veliko vam je zadovoljstvo i čast. Predstavite vam nekoga ko se u istinu razumije u to. S toga krenimo dalje sa mojim gostom. Hello, Richard. Welcome to Croatia. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Okay. Tell to our audience who is Richard Werner. Uh, well, I'm an economist, a trained economist at the London School of Economics and my doctorate at Oxford University. I've been working as academic researcher and also empirical uh, researcher. Um, but also I've always been working in the private sector at the same time, not just as an academic professor, you know, I'm professor of banking and professor of economics, uh, but I've also been a chief economist at a British investment bank. I've been um, senior managing director, senior portfolio manager at Bear Stearns Asset Management. I've set up, you know, manage global macro funds, investing. I'm still an, an UK authorized um, asset manager. Um, and I've been very much um, following what's, what's going on in, the, in economic um, policies and particularly been watching the central banks. I'm also known as the central bank watcher. I'm known for um, my proposal, which was when I was in Japan in the 1990s, uh, to get out of a post-banking crisis type of situation very quickly, which I called quantitative easing. It's become a bit of a household name since. The central banks certainly have taken on um, the concept, although you know there's, there's interesting differences in the implementation. I've also, in my empirical work, um, one of my books, Princes of the Yen, is a, was a number one bestseller in Japan. Um, in that book, I warned fairly early on um, about the ECB, which I'm sure we'll talk about. I warned in 2003 that the European Central Bank is likely to create bank credit driven asset bubbles, um, banking crises, followed by massive recessions and large scale unemployment. That's exactly what they did in Ireland, Portugal, Spain and Greece. But that's not the end of the story. You know, they keep doing this, this game. Um, what else? I've, I've produced a lot of academic um, research published in peer reviewed journals, including my empirical test on how banks actually work. After 5,000 years of banking, it was time to, to check how do banks actually work, <laughs> things like that. So I've, I've kept busy. But of course, um, there's, a, there's a number of important developments I've been watching um, for the last 20 years where I've also been activist um, trying to improve things. So I've, I've established a local first community interest company to set up uh, community banks, basically local banks for local communities and have a decentralized banking system because that's the, the most resilient, stable, and actually successful system that works best for the people. But we'll come to that, no doubt. Of course. Lots of interesting topics. But first, can you explain us uh, when you make this quantitative easing? What was the idea? Yes. So first of all, you have to understand the situation. Um, I had, well, I, I was in Japan in 1989, 1990. And then I was just on the way back to, to Oxford to continue there. I wrote my first uh, Oxford discussion paper um, at the Institute of Economics and Statistics at the time at Oxford University. And the, the situation was in, in 1991, um, the Japanese economy had boomed in the 1980s, so much so that a lot of commentators were saying it's going to be the 21st century will be the Japanese century. Japanese money was flooding the world, was buying up other companies, and Japan was doing really well. Um, then there was a stock market fall uh, from 1990. And by 91, the central bank was lowering interest rates. So by the standard analysis, everyone was saying, oh, stocks are cheap. They have got 7% economic growth in Japan. Japanese companies are so strong, which is true and they're lowering interest rates, that means the economy is going to accelerate by Japanese stocks. Now, in my paper, published in 91, back at Oxford, I warned the entire opposite was going to happen. Sell Japanese stocks. The Japanese stock market is going to go into meltdown because the economy is going to go into meltdown. And at the time, the top 20 banks in the world were Japanese, but I was predicting 
or they will go bankrupt and Japan will move into the biggest recession since the Great Depression. Um, and that was based on, on my analysis of how the banking system works and, um, and essentially the, the, the banking system under guidance of the Bank of Japan, the central bank had created a huge asset bubble and that was collapsing. Um, and then you get non-performing loans, very large sizes. And if you don't address this, this will result in a shrinkage of credit creation, therefore a shrinkage ec economic growth, big recession. And I predict that very early on at the time when most people were saying the opposite. And so, I mean, some people were listening. I got a job as chief economist in Tokyo as a result of uh, my work there. Um, and so I was working on ways to get out of this crisis, which I knew was going to happen, but no one else seemed to care or seemed to realize that it's going to be a huge crisis. And so then I worked in 94, um, I worked out this proposal, which I published in the, the, the largest and main financial newspaper in Japan, the Nikkei, the Nihon Keiza Shimbu, the Nikkei newspaper, the Nikkei index comes from there. Uh, they own the Financial Times, by the way, now. <laughs> um, and I published this in um, September 95. My proposal to get out of such a post-banking crisis recession um, very quickly, without cost to the taxpayer, without cost to society, can be done. And I called it quantitative easing to emphasize that it's not, because most people talk about interest rates, the price of money. I'm saying, no, it's not the price of money, it's the quantity. But when you say the quantity, then most people say, oh, you're a monetarist. Is it money supply, M2, M3? And that's also a bit misleading because they look at the wrong uh, measure of money. It, you shouldn't look at the deposits. We'll come to that. Instead, it's the bank credit creation. That's the key variable that I've been looking at. And that's my definition of quantitative easing. So my proposal was for the Bank of Japan, the central bank, to follow a two-step program. QE1, first step. QE, quantitative easing, is for the central bank to purchase the non-performing assets from banks. You move it to the central bank balance sheet. You purchase, of course, at the nominal value. The banking system is completely healthy as a result, more liquid than ever, problem solved. Costs, there are no costs. Um, there's not even inflation from this because it's still within the banking system. This doesn't actually inject money into the economy. It doesn't create money, so you can't create inflation with this. Um, and the problem is solved. No tax money used. Uh, national debt doesn't increase. So I recommended that as step one. But I was sure that this wouldn't be enough because the situation was so bad and also the loan officers at the banks, they were so shocked. All these loans from 1986 onwards turning non-performing, non they would not give out new loans. And then you don't get the new credit creation and that means you don't get new economic growth. Um, and then you still have a recession, even with the central bank helping solving the bad debt problem. The recession will take for a few years. And I thought, okay, we need a, a way to, in addition, boost now bank credit. Mm -hmm. And that was QE2, my second proposal. And that is for the central bank now to purchase performing assets from non-banks. Mm -hmm. A concrete example, it can be anything, but it's, it's something not from the banks. Normally, central banks don't deal with non-banks. They only deal with banks. That's the old way of central banking. Um, and the banks deal with the public and the rest of the economy. Um, but the central bank can buy from anyone, from you. You, know, buy, you own a plot of land, the central bank buys it, you get money. Well, where do you get your money? In your bank account. So now the central bank instructs the bank Mm -hmm. to credit you. Um, essentially, the bank gets high-powered money in its account with the central bank on the uh, bank asset side. And on the bank liability side, they will credit your account. This money is new, cr newly created. Mm -hmm. And it gives you money. And that's a way to push central bank money straight through the banking system into the economy. That was my second uh, part of the proposal. Now, when the, the Bank of Japan refused to do this, and they claimed for a long time, we can't do this and we don't need it. Then in 2001, so you know, six years later, they said, okay, well, we'll try quantitative easing. But they wanted to prove that it doesn't work because really they were under US instructions to prolong the recession in order to force structural change. I described this and proved this in my book, uh, Princes of the Yen. Mm 
-hmm. which you can get on uh, the website quantumpublishers.com. Otherwise, it's hard to get. Amazon doesn't like it. <laughs> so, I'll put link below. Okay. Um, and, and so um, in Japan, they weren't doing it. In fact, the Bank of Japan, to prove that QE doesn't work, they did a third possibility, which is to purchase performing assets from banks. Um, now, that gives a marginal benefit to banks, but it doesn't solve the bad debt problem in the banking mm -hmm. system. It doesn't inject enough money into the real economy either. So it's neither here nor there, and that's what they did. And then they said, well, this QE is not really working much. Um, but they didn't do the real QE. Then 2008, the US financial crisis came. And by the way, I warned in my book, Princes of the Yen, um, in the original 2001 Japanese version, I warned, based on my encounter with Alan Greenspan, who was uh, for 18 years head of the Federal Reserve, and my analysis of the Fed, that they were likely to do the same thing as in Japan, create a big asset bubble, and then when they bust this bubble, we'll get a global financial crisis. This is, of course, what happened in 2008. So then how do you get out of it? Um, at the time when I made my proposal, Ben Bernanke, as an academic, participated in these Japanese discussions. And it looks like he took to heart my recommendation because the Federal Reserve in 2008 was the only central bank to adopt at least half of my proposal, QE1. So the Fed purchased non-performing assets from the banks. And as a result, very quickly, US banks were healed. They didn't do the second step to push out bank credit into the economy. So it still took two years for bank credit to recover. But America was the first country to recover after the 2008 cri crisis. The other central banks in, in the UK and Europe, they didn't do this. And as a result, it took much longer to get out of this uh, crisis and recession. Now, fast forward to 2020. Um, in March 2020, the Federal Reserve and actually many other central banks, including the ECB, they adopted suddenly my second QE proposal, QE2. And actually, there was a warning ahead of time. It, it happened in August 2019 19, yeah. at the Jackson Hole Conference. We just had the, the current Jackson Conference, Jackson Hole Conference in the US. Mm -hmm. This is essentially the Federal Reserve has a conference, various people invited. But at that time, a private sector company, the biggest asset manager in the world, BlackRock, made a proposal in 2019, August, namely, and it's quite interesting that they said this. It's, you know, it's in print. You can check it out. Their proposal is, they say, there will be another crisis. OK, fair enough. I mean, the central banks have engineered so many crises, so that's an easy prediction. But they say, but next time, we must create inflation. They don't explain why. They just say, no, next crisis, we must create inflation. That's important. OK, how? And then they explain my QE2 proposal. We can create inflation if the central bank purchases performing assets from non-banks, just buy assets from the private sector. I mean, for Japan, I proposed, for example, the Bank of Japan could just buy property real estate because Tokyo has very few um, parks and the surface space of parks, park green areas, is very small in Tokyo. Um, and the property sector was in trouble anyway. So the central bank and the central bank should create credit injected into the economy. Well, the central bank should purchase land from anyone, turn it into Bank of Japan parks. By doing that, the seller's bank accounts are credited by the central bank at the bank, and the bank creates the new money, which is then um, injected into the economy. So that proposal is what BlackRock proposed in August 2019. And then in March 2020, the Fed adopted it, and they implemented it. Now, we know this for two reasons. Number one, the data. We could see a massive expansion simultaneously of both the Fed credit in, uh, transactions, as they also had in uh, 2008. But simultaneously, at that time, bank credit was shrinking, and the banks were shrinking credit creation. But in 2020, bank credit was simultaneously being boosted. In fact, much more even than the Fed, which makes sense. That's what happens um, in growth terms. And, um, and the second reason why we know this is exactly what happened is because they hired BlackRock. The Federal Reserve officially, look it up, 
hired BlackRock to go out and buy all these many assets from the private sector. Um, and of course, they bought things like corporate bonds from the private sector, large scale. The same, the ECB did the same. Now, when I saw this, I was completely shocked. By the time I had the data, it was around Ma uh, May 2020. Mm. I had the data and I was shocked. And I realized, okay, this will create significant inflation because the economy was growing. Bank credit was already expand expanding at five, six percent. It had not contracted. Um, and they were now injecting this additional money. Um, so there's a massive explosion in bank credit. How much did they inject? Um, well, it's in the trillions of dollars, trillions of euros. Um, and you see, it happened, of course, at the time when at the, uh, simultaneously they restricted supply. And if you boost demand so much by injecting new money into the economy, while you restrict supply, of course, you're going to push up prices. Suddenly, there's much more demand for existing output goods and services. So general consumer price inflation, which we haven't had significantly since the, since the 70s, um, was created by the central banks on purpose. I mean, it was, they said it beforehand, we want to create inflation. They did it. And then it was clear we were going to get significant inflation. So I warned 18 months later, it takes you know, more than a year. 18 months later, you get significant inflation, which means double digit inflation. And that's exactly what we got. So it was a central bank policy. It had nothing to do with you know, President Biden says it's Putin's price hike. <laughs> it's complete nonsense. That means that doesn't matter what war started in, in Europe, doesn't matter anything else. It was exactly the only thing was Federal Reserve policy. Exactly. If you, if you check the timing, anyway, the war, um, <laughs> when the war in Europe, February 2022, um, okay. started, um, that was already too late. Inflation had already picked up significantly. You know, it, so the timing doesn't work. Also, oil prices, energy prices, gas prices, the timing doesn't work to explain that inflation. Now, the thing is, interestingly, if you check the 1970s, where they tell us the same story, you know, they tell us, oh, 1970s, well, that was an inflationary period because we had, there was this war in the Middle East, and then OPEC, the oil producing countries, Arab countries, had a boycott, and they didn't sell oil to Europe and America. That's why we had an oil price shock, and we had inflation. That's the official story. Okay. But the timing doesn't work, yeah. just the same as now. And you look at what the central banks did. They did the same thing. It was also central bank created. Mm -hmm. We'll come to this a little later and in present time. But just to explain how banks work. For our audience, because people are thinking that how they are teach us on universities, they are think also that they are borrowing some kind of money what is on deposits in the bank. Can you explain us and also tell us how you know that, how banks work? Yes. Well, actually, there's three theories of banking. And I found that quite uh, puzzling, really, when I was a student. Why are there so many different theories? And they say different things. And nobody had done the obvious, necessary, scientific thing to do, which is we need an empirical test to, f to find out which theory actually is true or not. Uh, so three theories. The one that you mentioned is the one that is still currently dominant. And if you just pick an ordinary textbook, um, university textbook, they will likely mention this currently dominant theory. That's the financial intermediation theory, which says a bank is not so important, it's not so powerful, because it's just an intermediary. It collects deposits. Then it does the analysis and lends out these funds. And so the bank is, is, is just an intermediary, therefore not so important. Therefore, economists have actually, in the last half century, not included banks in their economic models, literally. So when the 2008 crisis happened, uh, a banking crisis that had severe consequences for the economy in many countries, and journalists would ask a famous economist, professor at Harvard, MIT, um, Oxford, the honest answer by the professor of economics would have been, sorry, I cannot comment on this. Oh, well, why are you a professor of economics? There's a huge banking crisis and recession all over the world. Why can't you comment? Well, my economic theories do not include any banks. That would have been the honest answer. Of course, they were too embarrassed to admit that. So they talk about banks, say something, but actually they have no clue. Literally, their models, even the leading models at the central banks, 
have not included banks because of this financial intermediation theory saying, well, banks are not important, they're just an intermediary. Okay, now the second theory is a slightly older theory that was dominant until the 1960s. And this theory says, I mean, there's some similarity. It says each individual bank is like that, is, a, is an intermediary. It gathers deposits and then lends out the money. But many banks together somehow in the system, they interact and collectively somehow they create money. There's a money multiplier and they call this the fractional reserve theory of banking. And it's slightly complex, but don't waste your time trying to understand it <laughs> because actually the question is which of the three theories is correct and then two will be wrong. Okay, so what's the third one? The third one is the oldest and that's more than 100 years old. Actually it goes back to the first um, person to properly formulate this was uh, Henry McLeod, a lawyer, um, a very experienced lawyer, barrister uh, in England and member of um, one of the inns of law, which is inside the City of London Corporation. And um, the Inner Temple, I think he was actually which is, a, is an independent sovereign state within the sovereign state of the City of London Corporation. Um, but that's another story. Anyway, so Henry McLeod explained this in 1855. <laughs> um, some economists read this like Schumpeter, um, and therefore they had a better understanding of what, what happened. But many people have since forgotten this, this theory. It's called the credit creation theory. And Henry McLeod was very clear. He said, banks are not financial intermediaries. It's just not true. Banks are something much more powerful, much more influential. They are the creators of the money supply. They create money. When a bank gives a loan, it newly creates money. The money for the loan didn't exist before. It's newly created and added to the money supply. And of course, you can imagine that has consequences. So we've got these three theories. Now, which one is correct? Well, of course, I already, from my experience in banking and in, um, in you know, my, my first economic model that I used in 91 and 92 to make this prediction on, on Japan and economic growth and forecasting, um, I formulated this theory which incorporated bank credit creation into a macro model. It was one of the first proper macroeconomic models that included bank credit. Then it works. You can predict what's going to happen when you get an asset bubble or a banking crisis or just steady growth. And um, so I was, you know, of course I was already aware, but I thought what needs to empirically establish this scientifically. So I, I looked for a bank to collaborate with me mm -hmm. to do an empirical test. And the question was simply, okay, there's three theories of banking. They differ in, in, the, in, in the main respect, they differ is um, where does the money come from when a bank gives out a loan? You know, the, the money for the loan, where does it come from? And that's something we can check. We just need to take out a loan from the bank and then empirically observe what's happening and show exactly where is the money coming from. The financial intermediation theory says the money is coming from other deposits. The fractional reserve theory says the money comes from excess reserves at the central bank held by the bank. And that's being used for a new loan. And the credit creation theory says the money is not coming from anywhere. It's newly created and added to the money supply when somebody you know, does the loan and the bank implements the loan. So there are three different explanations, which one is true. Now, it took a long time for me to find a bank that would collaborate because of banking secrecy, customer uh, secrecy. Of course, banking is highly regulated, all the regulations. So somebody wants to look inside here, oh, this will be very uh, risky. And, and so the bigger banks, initially, they said, of course, we help you. But when it came to actually doing the test, they said, sorry, we can't do that. But I found a bank. Uh, which was one of the, the German cooperative banks. Um, and that's the largest number, um, it's, the, it's the largest type of bank by, by numbers of banks that are of this type. So um, Europe, actually the majority of banks in Europe are cooperative banks. And in Germany it's the 
Volksbanken, smaller Raiffeisen, not the big Austrian Raiffeisen in Vienna, but their local headquarters, independent Raiffeisen banks and Volksbanks, and there, in total, there were more than 1,000 of them. And they used the same IT system. Um, there was the largest type of banks and the same IT, so it was all conforming, and therefore my results were quite representative. You know, this is the most common type of bank using the same IT system. Because nowadays, of course, it's all in the IT system, what's happening in banking. OK, so I went there. In fact, there was a BBC reporter filming um, at the time also. So it was recorded, this historic moment. I took out an actual loan, 200,000 euros. Um, I borrowed. They were a bit nervous, like, could this all be a setup for me? Because I said, no, I need to get the money. It has to be real. I don't want some theoretical simulation. It has to be actual. And we have to then check where's the money come from. So I got my 200,000 euros from the bank. And what we found was, and I could show in detail, in two tests, actually. One is uh, called, you can Google this, um, can banks individually create money out of nothing? And the second test is published a bit later um, called Lost Century in Economics. The three, three areas of banking and the, mm -hmm. um, the ultimate evidence. Anyway, um, and the result was banks are not financial intermediaries. The deposits didn't change at all. Uh, even the reserves at the central bank, they didn't care. They didn't check. They didn't touch it. The money was newly created when I took out the loan. And that was credited to my account. It was newly added to the money supply. Now, Henry McLeod was a lawyer, and it's actually easiest to understand this by looking at the legal situation. Because the economics already has been designed to make it complicated so people don't understand what's happening. Whereas ultimately, the reality is determined by the law. You know, there's the, the laws of a country. You know, we talk about the laws of physics. They determine physics. What is determining what's happening in the country? Well, the laws of the country. <laughs> That's why the law is very relevant. And if you look at English law, it's relevant because modern banking was created in the 17th century in England. And English law is very clear about these things. So um, in English law, which Henry MacLeod uh, referred to, the first thing um, that's quite shocking is really when you realize economists call banks, they call them deposit-taking institutions that lend money. But we know from the law, the legal reality is the opposite. Banks don't take deposits, and banks don't lend money. That seems initially surprising. But I'll prove it to you now, very quickly. Banks don't take deposits, because at law, and in English law, this is still, until this day, unchanged, very clear. At law, there is no such thing as a bank deposit. This doesn't exist. That category of money is just used to obfuscate, to hide the reality. So th there are high court judgments that are unchallenged in England, which say when you do what you think is a deposit at the bank, you think you own the money. Sorry, you're wrong. There is no such thing as a bank deposit. At law, what you're doing is you are lending money to the bank. And the owner of that money is now the bank. You have a claim on the bank. But the, the, the borrower has control. They borrowed the money. They can do with it what they want. And you, you see this also in the accounting. That's why it's on their balance sheet. Whereas we depositors, we think we own the money. But at law, we don't own it. Um, it's a loan we've given to the bank. So it's correct to say banks don't take deposits, because there is no such thing as a bank deposit in reality, in legal reality. But surely banks lend money. That's how they earn their money, isn't it? Well, they don't actually lend money. What they do is uh, banks are in the business of purchasing securities. When you take out a loan, you have to sign a document. Now, at law, and again, English law is very clear about this, this is a promissory note. It's a debt instrument you are signing what Americans call an IOU, I, I owe you money, a debt instrument, a security, a credit or debt security. Mm -hmm. 
you're the issuer, that means you are borrowing. The bank is buying that instrument from you. So on the bank balance sheet, as you sign the loan contract, they have a claim on you that you will repay this money with interest. And they lengthen their balance sheet because they have a new asset. On their liability side, that's where the deposits are, what we call deposits, which is simply records of how much money the bank owes us, you see. They will now, I mean, you will say, I don't care about the details, just give me the money. And the banker will say, if, if he's careful, the banker will say, we'll trans, well, no, we will, you will find it in your account. Yeah. If he says we'll transfer it, that's wrong because no transfer takes place. You see, they will just credit you with the money, which means um, they add this liability to their liabilities on the balance sheet, which is called customer deposit, when actually, it's another type of liability, namely an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract. They also should pay up. And they actually quite slightly incorrectly classify this wrongly as another type of liability called a customer deposit. Because what we call deposits is simply the records of how much banks owe us. Because we're lending money to them, you see. And, what and that's how the money is created. That's how the money supply is created. And what happens when you repay your loan? Then the money supply shrinks. And this money um, becomes out of circulation. Mm -hmm. Because by repaying, um, you are withdrawing it from somewhere else in the economy. And what happens? And the, 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 the balance sheet will shrink. And the money supply at that moment, if nothing else changes, then the money supply would shrink. But of course, in reality, many things happen at the same time. You need to look at the net result. Mm -hmm. And banks usually give out many new loans. So normally, bank credit steadily increases, even when there's repayments, because they have many other new loans. Yeah. Sorry. And interest stays to bank. Of course, banks charge interest uh, for their lending. Um, and, and that goes to the bank that on the balance sheet becomes part of their, their profits. That's on the P&L, the profit and loss statement. Great. That was very important to understand that we can continue to additional thing. Now we are coming to today's time when we have so much inflation. We explain it, you explain it, how this inflation became. What was happening at the same time in Europe? Same thing like in the United States. Yes, the ECB did the same thing. So the, the inflation was created by the central banks, um, so Federal Reserve, ECB and others, purchasing assets from the non-bank sector uh, to a vast scale and therefore literally creating money and pumping it into the economy, forcing it into the economy through the banking system. As they, buy, as they buy, for example, corporate bonds. So these are other promissory notes, debt instruments issued by companies now. The central bank buys them, but the company doesn't have an account with the central bank. So how is the company that is issuing these loans, these, this debt, this corporate bond, how are they going to be paid? Well, the central bank transfers money to the banker of that company. And in the bank balance sheet now of that bank, you see on the asset side an increase in their reserves at the central bank. They simply credit them. And they gave the instruction, you know, you should pay that person. So the bank will now credit the uh, account of the seller or issuer of these corporate bonds that the central bank has bought with the amount of money. And that is a new deposit that's created like with a loan out of nothing. But on, it was triggered by the central bank. So the central bank instruction is a way to force bank credit into the economy. And that's why, now, because they, they did this massively in 2020, um, and they did it at a time when there was restricted supply, and they also had other um, you know, incentives in place to increase consumption, it's very clear that co demand, consumer demand was going to rise enormously at a time of restricted supply so you could only get inflation. There was no other way. And that's what they did. And they, they can't say, oh, we did this accidentally, because it's a very unusual policy that's maybe only taken once in a century or twice maximum in a century. You know, it happens very rarely. But they all took it at the same time. So how can they say, oh, it's an accident. We just 
we didn't notice we did this. It's impossible. So it's very clear it's intentional, internationally coordinated, and as we know from the Fed, the goal was from the beginning, the declared goal was to create this inflation. Okay, what was the reason? What is staying behind this? They have to have some reason why they want to create inflation. Yes, um, it, it is a very important question, but it's also not so easy to answer. One thing is that's always good is to go into the historical record because our data set as scientists and researchers, the empirical data set is history. You know, these are the facts we can refer to. So the last period of inflation, the 1970s, becomes relevant. And as I mentioned early, earlier on, it's the same mechanism. The central banks created that inflation. It was not OPEC. The timing didn't work. I mean, in fact, Henry Kissinger had to go to Saudi Arabia to persuade Saudi Arabia to quadruple the oil price because they thought, oh, we can't do that. That's too radical. But America wanted it but they kept it secret because they wanted to say, oh, it's Saudi Arabia and, and OPEC countries creating this inflation. Actually, the story was this. America had a problem. It had huge current account deficits, not just like today. And that means the big countries with current account surpluses, the big exporters of the day were Japan and Germany. They were selling much more to America than they were buying from America. America didn't have enough attractive things for Germans to buy, for Japanese to buy. So they had this huge current account deficit. Initially, they responded because there was the Bretton Woods um, um, mechanism. We had fixed exchange rates in the 1960s until you know, the early 70s. And the center of the system was the US dollar. Everyone was fixed to the dollar, mm -hmm. and the dollar was fixed to gold. Now, America abused that system by creating a lot of dollars. They just printed dollars. Yeah. And um, Europe had to take it. Japan had to take it. Germany had to take it. They could not say no because they have American troops in Germany, and there's American troops in Japan. So they didn't complain in Japan and Germany, but there was one country in Europe that did complain, and they did not have American troops in the country, so that's why they could speak, and that was France. France was not at the time member of NATO, and they watched what was happening, and they had the correct analysis. The Americans are just printing dollars, and then they're just buying, Amer you know, America is buying European assets. They're buying French companies, German companies, they're buying real estate, anything they want with printed dollars. And it's a fixed exchange rate system, nothing happens. But what happened was, of course, France decided, the French leadership decided, under Bretton Woods, we can change all these dollars that we're accumulating. They were getting huge amounts of dollars in Europe. We're going to exchange them into gold. And they started doing that. So American gold reserves started to drop and drop. And there were dramatic moments, you know, when uh, the French Navy was sent with a big, huge Navy... Um, uh, battleship to Manhattan, landing in Manhattan, and the captain of the, the commander, the um, admiral perhaps of the Navy ship, was given the instruction to go in Manhattan to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and take out the French gold. You see, because when they changed it into gold, the, the Americans initially said, oh, no problem, we'll change this into gold. We'll keep the gold for you in custody at the Fed in New York, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the French thought, mm, okay, this is not quite what we had in mind. <laughs> Actually, we better take that gold, you see. And this is what happened. Now, it didn't take very long, just one or two years, and the Americans decided, okay, we have to stop this because gold reserves were going to go down, and the, the whole world would realize what they were doing. So they rather wanted to cover up the reality. And it was embarrassing, but it helped hide the true story, which I've just told you. Namely, in August 1971, President Nixon at the time, he went on television and he gave a speech. He says, there's some bad actors out there, some speculators are attacking the US dollar, and I'm now kind of acting to defend the US dollar and to do that, I need to temporarily suspend convertibility of the dollar into gold. 
temporarily. Temporarily, yeah. Still today, of course, it continues. So when politicians say temporarily, watch out.